The rainforest canopy, floating a hundred feet above us, has been an unknown world until now. A new breed of explorer is now venturing out onto the green roof of the world. Going where no one has gone before, we join the adventures of these heroes of the high frontier. In the darkest depths of the darkest forest, the crew assembles. The pioneering spirit harnesses modern technology as a courageous band sets off on a voyage of discovery. A flame ignites a quest to a place of our world, but until now, always just above our reach. The rainforest canopy. Almost a century ago, explorer William Beebe wrote, yet another continent of life remains to be discovered, not upon the earth, but one or two hundred feet above it. There awaits a rich harvest for the naturalist who overcomes the obstacles and mounts to the summits of the jungle trees. The rainforest canopy is home to more living creatures than anywhere else on the face of the earth. Many are born here and will die here too, rarely if ever touching the earth. Their lives, their whole world has been a mystery. The canopy is the last biological frontier on earth. Biologist Terry Irwin began exploring this world just 16 years ago. Since he had no way to reach the canopy, he brought it down to Earth. Clouds of insecticide welled up, and a rain of entirely new and unknown creatures came down. So many creatures of so many kinds, it seemed there were 20 times as many species on this planet as we had thought. The canopy was a hotbed of evolution. Just what was going on up there? There was only one way to find out. A combination slingshot fishing pole is Nalini Nudkarni's own invention for shooting a line a hundred feet up. Yes. Oh my God. A 
accuracy is essential to get that all-important first line up over a limb. A climbing rope is hauled up, to which she attaches her Jumar ascenders. She's been entrusting her life to this gear for 19 years. I realized at that moment, that first rope climb, I knew where I was going for the rest of my life. I was going up to the canopy. It takes hard work and courage to conquer this new world. But when they climb, Nalini and other canopy researchers are also returning to a very old world. Our ancestors lived in trees. Perhaps we are returning to a place buried deep in our primal memory. place of primal fears. Braving these dizzying heights, the first canopy researchers discovered a complex web of life. We really felt like pioneers. We felt like we were frontiersmen going to where no human had ever gone before. And, and everything we picked up was something new and something different, new species, new interactions. Nalini learned that giant forest trees actually sprouted roots from their uppermost branches. Jay Malcolm found that animals believed to be extremely rare were actually common creatures, if you knew where to look for them. Meg Lauman investigated the chemical warfare between animals and plants, a source of the canopy's bewildering diversity. And Neil Rettig spent months up a tree, unveiling the life of one of the world's most magnificent eagles. Working in the canopy has taught them that this is where the rainforest lives, where light is turned into life. The canopy is the powerhouse of the forest. It's where sunlight changes into stored energy. It's where trees reproduce, where the flowers and the fruits are, where pollination takes place, where fruit dispersal takes place. So it's, I think it's really where everything's happening in the forest. This is where the birds feed. You can see where, where all the, the bark and the, um, the epiphytes have been sort of knocked off because this is where the birds themselves and the monkeys come and feed on these fig fruits. I can't believe I am... Today I got up much higher than I ever had before. I was able to shift the ropes around so that I was actually able to get to the very top of this tree. Wow! Wow! I can see forever! Just 25 years ago, up the rivers of Suriname and Guyana, came an expedition in search of one of the canopy's greatest predators. It was the personal quest of a 23-year-old Neil Rettig. He and two friends sought to witness and film the life of the harpy eagle. The harpy's life in the wild was practically unknown until Neil strapped on spikes, like telephone repairmen use, and jury rigged a reinforced cable big enough to wrap around the huge girth of a rainforest giant. Somehow they scaled 150 feet to reach the nest. When I think of the crazy things that all three of us did, Wolfgang, myself, and Alan, it's unbelievable. I mean, 
We're lucky we're still here. They built a blind from which they could watch the nest. They used a ladder to climb from the crown of one tree up into the nest tree itself. While exposed outside the blind, they were under frequent attack by the most powerful eagle in the world. When the blind was complete, Neil looked through his lens to meet the fierce gaze of the harpy for the first time. The harpy eagle will, will always be my favorite bird of prey. I feel like I'm part of it, or it's part of me. After a month of observation, a tiny ball of fluff appeared between the mother's powerful talons. Neil was the first to ever glimpse, not to mention film, a newly hatched harpy chick in the wild. But his exhilaration almost proved fatal. I had just finished spending three days in the blind watching the chick hatch, and I was completely overwhelmed with, with excitement. And I started climbing down, using the belts and the climbing spikes, and I was just thinking about other things. I was daydreaming. I was so excited that the chick had actually hatched, and I filmed in the early morning when the chick was a tiny little baby. And I just I remember leaning backward and just falling into space. And it was like slow motion. I remember falling down and trying to grab a hold of the, a palm tree, crashing through the vegetation and landing on my back. And then, then I couldn't breathe. And I looked up, and uh, Wolfgang, my uh, associate, was coming out of the blind, and the eagle came and ripped off a piece of his pants and flew away with it. He shot back up in the blind, and he said he'd come down in the dark. Well, finally, they, they, he climbed down, and they carried me out in a stretcher. And one week later, I was, I was climbing again. That's how crazy I was. Protected by luck and a motorcycle helmet, Neil suffered only a few broken ribs from his 55-foot fall. He continued to film, capturing the parents hunting like sharks among the green billows of the canopy. Sloths are a favorite prey of the harpy. Usually, they eat part of it before bringing it to the nest. But this time, dinner is delivered alive. Neil wanted to follow the chick to independence, but having survived a fall from five stories, he was felled by an insect bite. Infected by a parasite, he was forced to leave. I knew someday I had to go back and complete the entire study and actually document what happens when that young harpy makes its first flight. Neil was one of the first to venture up into this high-flung new frontier, but he and other pioneers were soon climbing into canopies all over the world. The rainforest canopy is like an eighth continent an archipelago of floating islands that encircles the globe in a belt above the equator. Originally, it covered 12% of the planet's land area, but more than half of it has been destroyed by logging and agriculture. Yet, it remains home to more than half of all the animals and plants living on Earth. Canopy explorers are discovering that each island of rainforest has a nature all its own. Malaysia's canopy is one of the highest and most unobtainable in the world. Like giant lollipops, trees rise a hundred feet before spreading their crowns into the clouds. From miles around, animals are gathering here for a great event unique to Southeast Asia's rainforests. They are coming for a feast. 
In the course of just a few weeks, most of the trees here will bear fruit, laying out a banquet in the sky. The seeds of the tallest trees helicopter down a hundred feet into the canopy below. From there, it's another hundred feet down into the dark. Orangutans make an endless pilgrimage through these treetops in search of fruit. They travel alone, except for females and their young. They maintain detailed mental maps of huge tracts of forest, memorizing the location of each favored fruit tree and the shortest routes between them. While still a baby at mother's breast, an orang begins a lifetime of learning just where and when to find ripe fruit. When a wave of mass fruiting hits a valley, it gives the orang something more precious than food. A chance to socialize with their own kind. Infants get a rare chance to play with others their own age. Long thought to be loners by nature, we now know that orangs enjoy each other's company. When there's enough food to go around. Even the big males are welcome to join the party. Gibbons too relish the sweet, abundant fruit. Usually, orangs would threaten a gibbon who dared to eat in the same fruiting tree, but with plenty of food around, the little ape can eat his fill in peace. Then he swings away with effortless grace, hundreds of feet above the ground. Orangs are too heavy for such acrobatics. Instead, they descend to the understory, where they put their weight to good use. Still 50 feet above the forest floor, they sway back and forth on the pliable saplings, working their way between the taller fruiting trees. Moving among the trees presents special challenges for all canopy creatures, especially those without limbs. A snake requires exquisite soar through the open colonnades of a Malaysian forest, just one leap ahead of their predators. These are the Gothic cathedrals of the canopy. But there are places that resemble the tangled webs of jungle lore, the lush forests of Costa Rica. Here, epiphytes, the plants growing on the trees, may weigh more than the foliage of the trees themselves. Woody vines called lianas knit the canopy together, providing highways for all sorts of creatures and making a prehensile tail a useful and common adaptation.
The booming calls of howler monkeys attract the attention of a passing jaguar. For canopy animals, it is the forest floor that is a dangerous place. A jaguar would love to snatch a howler, if only it could reach their treetop refuge. The close-knit canopy is a green roof shading the forest floor, a dark netherworld populated by the undead. Most seedlings that sprout here slowly starve in the endless gloom. When they finally break out into the tropical sunshine, they turn the power of the sun into the stuff of life. No sooner is light turned into substance than it is consumed transforming the sun's energy yet again. Orchids don't have to fight for their place in the sun. They start life up here already. They are epiphytes, so-called air plants, which thrive without any connection to the earth below. But one infamous plant makes the most of both worlds. The tiny seedling sends down. Once it connects with the earth, it gains new power. Its leaves compete for light with a host tree, while its roots multiply and merge into misshapen limbs. They wrap around the trunk of the host in a deadly embrace while the roots solidify into the trunk of a forest giant with an empty heart. The strangler fig may be a killer, but it also provides food for countless animals and support for thousands of epiphytes in lush, hanging gardens. Epiphytes are the particular passion of Nalini Nadkarni. She practically lives up here when she's working. She studies a cloud forest and each day is reminded of how it got its name. I think one of the most amazing feelings of working in the canopy is when the mist and fog and cloud roll up the mountainside and it hits the forest, it hits the tree in front of you, and you suddenly realize you are being enveloped in a cloud. This daily misting provides just what epiphytes need. Mosses catch droplets drifting past. With each drop, they gather a bit of dust, some from as far away as the Sahara Desert. Soil builds up, and the hanging gardens of epiphytes grow in size and diversity, building more soil. A kiss from a desert wind, blown wet and warm, feeds the forest. I suddenly feel like this is what an epiphyte feels like. This is the nourishing mist and fog that's coming through. So I feel it on my face, I feel it on my hands, and I understand better what an epiphyte is. Nalini has discovered that the moss mats that blanket the oldest branches play a vital role. These mats are just full of roots. They sort of knit the soil together. Just finished clipping these last roots. And then the moment of peeling them away. Watch this. And what you see is this soil, and it's just riddled with roots. It smells great. It's like this very earthy smell, which is kind of funny when you think of where, where we are. But you can see that the branch is actually not all that thick. Um, the branches always look a lot more thick when they have their moss mats on them. So there are lots of invertebrates, insects, earthworms that live in this material high, high above the forest floor. 
you have to get up here. You have to look in these plants. You have to look in the soil to figure out really what's going on up here. Nalini's perseverance and her daring led her to a remarkable discovery. Oh, a really amazing thing about these moss mats are that they can actually nourish the tree itself. They can feed the tree. Some species of trees can put out roots from their own branches and trunks that go into the soil and take in food and water. And so the epiphytes are getting support. They're getting their place in the sun. But the tree is getting nutrients and water from the mats that the epiphytes make. So it's kind of like the epiphytes are paying rent to a landlord. And it's just a really amazing situation. Suspended in three-dimensional space, these hanging gardens are like coral reefs in the sky, creating opportunities for a whole community of life. They provide good pickings for a kawati, flowers and nectar, even ants for a protein snack with a bite. But ants are just the appetizer. Fruit is the main course. Following its nose, the Gwati is led to the very summit of a great tree. Monkeys with prehensile tails are better equipped to feed up here. But though the Gwati is no canopy specialist, he's not to be denied. He searches for the ripest fruit. His cast-offs feed a band of Kawati females and their young on the forest floor. The seeds would never survive beneath their parent tree anyway, where specialized fungi and insects wait to prey upon them. Animals connect the sunlit canopy with the earth below in many ways. Flowers are designed to attract animals, but leaf-cutter ants are not invited guests. They strip palatable blooms en masse. Millions of ants working together, collecting the bounty of the canopy and sucking it down into the earth below. Whether they are carried or just float down, bits of fallen canopy are rapidly recycled back into living matter. Fingers of slime mold spread over the leaf litter, breaking it down into plant food. The gossamer threads of fungi help the roots of trees absorb 95% of the nutrients, building forest giants that rise up into the light. The leaf litter hides many miracles. A strawberry frog guards its eggs, which develop in a puddle of rainwater. As soon as the tadpole hatches, she moves it to a more secure nursery, encouraging it to wriggle up onto her back. No bigger than a thumbnail, she undertakes a phenomenal commute, heading straight up. She climbs in search of a bromeliad, an epiphyte with a rosette of leaves that channel with miniature sea monsters. Mosquito larvae, feeding on rotting debris, which also acts as fertilizer for the plant.
She drops her tadpole off into the first empty reservoir she finds. But her work is not yet done. She has other tadpoles stashed in other bromeliads, and every two days she makes the rounds. Her offspring's telltale vibrations signal her to lay another egg, but this egg isn't fertile. It's dinner. It's her tadpole's only food, a brilliant strategy for survival, until a thirsty Kawati happens by. It takes researchers years to discover such elaborate strategies, and just seconds for a Kawati to send them astray. The sky-high world of epiphytes is made up of millions of such little life and death dramas. I love epiphytes. I don't know why I do. I think it's something about they live in the treetops. And ever since I was a little kid, I like climbing trees. It was a world I could escape to. No grown-ups. No grown-ups climb trees. So it was just my little world where I could go up and read. And it's been 17 years. And every time I put on my Jumars and go up a rope, it's that same feeling of exhilaration of what will I find today? The rainforest canopy yields its secrets to only the most determined explorers. It took Neil Reddick 14 years to return to Guyana and his work with the Harpy Eagle. I think what's at the center of the connection of the canopy is, for me, a link back to my youth when I was a 23-year-old wild adventurer. Just the odors of the flowers and the bird calls opened up all these memory banks, sort of been shut down for all those years. It was unbelievable. It was just like I had never left. A harpy's calls helped lead Neil to its nest, just a few miles from his old study site. Neil was now one of the world's best wildlife cinematographers, but he was as thrilled as ever to set eyes on a harpy chick. It was like having a reunion with an old friend. Possibly one of the new adults was the baby from 1975. For six months, Neil kept his vigil. As he watched the chick grow, he wondered if he would finally capture the maiden flight of a harpy on film. Every day brought Neil and the chick closer to their goal. While Neil watched, the chick prepared, exercising and testing its wings. Then one day, Neil turned the camera on just in time. A long-awaited milestone for the chick, its mother, and perhaps most of all, for Neil. Such long-term dedication has coaxed a few of its secrets from the canopy. But as the light of day fades, a cloak of mystery descends. frontier in canopy exploration beckons out of the gathering dark. Few have dared to climb into this high-flung wilderness at night, 
when it comes alive with a whole different community of animals. They come out to reap the bounty the canopy built by day. Bats are the unsung heroes of the rainforest. They hover over the branches, sniffing out the ripest fruit. Only just able to carry its prize, it flies to a roost where it can feed in safety. Bats play vital roles in pollination, insect control, and the reproduction of trees. The bat eats the sweet flesh of the fruit, but discards the seeds. Here they fall far from their parent tree, where they have a better chance of surviving. Animals help many canopy plants reproduce. Epiphytes face unique challenges spreading their seeds around the hanging gardens. One solution, a sticky coating that keeps the seeds from falling to the forest floor and attracts a particular species of ant. These ants are strong enough to win the tug of war with the plant. They carry them to their nest, but they eat only the nutritious coating leaving the seeds to sprout. The seedlings grow, turning the nest into a garden overflowing with the ants' favorite food plants, some of which are never found anywhere. In the great Amazon basin, they could travel from treetop to treetop for thousands of miles. The woolly opossum was thought to be one of the rarest of the Amazon's creatures. Its prehensile tail is naked at the tip to give it a strong grip. They are built like little wrestlers. Babies cling tightly to their mothers, who grasp the thinnest of lianas with powerful feet. Those without a family in tow have more freedom of movement. They are all searching for sweets. They drink nectar and eat fruit. The mother must seek her dinner elsewhere. Using aerial roots as a ladder, she follows another sweet scent. So sweet is this perfume, it distracts the lone opossum from its meal. The aroma of ripe banana proves irresistible. Mother and offspring are lucky to have missed this treat. The woolly opossum finds the morning light unnerving. By now, it should be hidden in the darkness of its lair.
but it has no need to fear. The trap was set by biologist Jay Malcolm, who's exploring the night world of the canopy, with some startling results. These woolly opossums are the single most abundant mammal in this forest, more abundant than any other kind of rodent, more abundant than any kind of monkey, or any other kind of mammal. Um, that was a total surprise. People knew that there were things up there, we just didn't know how many or where, so when we started doing this, everything we found out was brand new. Gaining access to the canopy and putting traps up in the canopy has really allowed us to enter a new world, a new realm of, of research. And we know almost nothing. There's new species of small mammals, so there are promised to be a lot more surprises. Off you go. From museum rarity to common critter, they just had to look for it in the right place. To service his many traps each day, Jay learned an ancient technique of tree climbing. This thing called the peconia, or foot belt. It's the same method that the Amerindians have always used to climb up palm trees. And the way it works is what you're really doing, you're sort of pushing out against your heels. So you're really sort of turning your feet into a pair of pliers. To climb seven stories in a matter of seconds requires incredible skill, strength, and stamina. Should he lose his grip, even for an instant, he would crash to the ground below. Having attached a small pulley, he raises the simple and ingenious frame for his trap. Once it is in place, he slides down like a fireman on a very long and rough pole. Then he simply raises his trap into position, where it'll await an overnight guest. Jay finds that he captures opossums only within the undisturbed canopy. Canopy animals are stopped short where the fabric of the forest is slashed by a clear cut. 13 years after the chainsaw stopped, this place is still a no man's land, a desert. An area that's been cut over and used, and you know what it's like walking down there. It's hot, full of all sorts of burrs and messy stuff. From a life standpoint, it's been basically trashed. There's not much left there. It's just a, a tragedy. Despite efforts to save it, the rainforest is being consumed at an unprecedented rate, lending an air of urgency to canopy exploration. But in the face of such a huge problem, you have to dream larger still. A lighter than air arc ascends with the dawn. Suspended beneath is the canopy luge, a sled bearing excited researchers on the trip of their lives. Among them is one of the founders of the field, Meg Lauman, who's explored canopies the world over. But today, she goes where no one has gone before. Their mission, to trawl the green sea of the canopy to get some inkling of the biological riches it contains. The blimp maneuvers the luge carefully, sidling up to a tree crown 150 feet in the air. As soon as they are close enough to reach, nets are wielded frantically. 
They scoop up insects and collect whole branches in an all-out effort to gather as many samples of canopy life as quickly as they can. It would have taken weeks of difficult and dangerous climbing to get the samples they amass in just one morning on the luge. The luge is part of Operation Canopy, which invites the best researchers the world over to join its venture. They also use the Canopy Raft, a web-like platform dropped over the crowns of several trees. Walking atop the swaying trees is like walking on the face of the sea. I guess I feel really special walking on the tops of trees and I really tiptoe all the time because I'm frightened of disturbing these poor little buds or snapping a branch. But in actual fact, with the raft and its wonderful mesh floor, our weight is dispersed really nicely. Meg's work in the treetops has shown that over millions of years, plants evolved poisons to defend themselves from being eaten, while insects evolved ways to overcome these toxins. Rainforest plants and insects are waging a biochemical war. The arsenal of poisons and antidotes created by canopy plants and animals are a pharmaceutical gold mine. They are the stuff that medicines are made of. Who knows what cures to what dread diseases may be hidden among the samples collected by the crew of Operation Canopy. Each evening, the best canopy scientists in the world share a meal, along with their ideas. By swapping techniques, samples, and data, they are beginning a new era in canopy research. They've blazed a trail into the last biological frontier, opening this eighth continent to exploration. Upon their shoulders, the next generation can scale new heights. Today, Canopy Tours offer a thrilling new perspective on life. But the greatest thrill is realizing we are part of this beautiful world floating above our own, for good or ill. The same pioneering spirit that brought us up into the canopy has given us the power to destroy it. Canopy explorers have given us a unique opportunity to save this amazing world. We have a choice. It's up to us which path we take. <laughs>